All right, so this is a very exciting lesson where we start putting all of our concepts and skills together with, that we've been learning about first derivatives, second derivatives, um, increase, decrease, max, mins, inflection points, concavity, all those things. So um, I'm working on page 250 from our textbook and it's example number 20, which has a function that looks like this and they ask us to basically find all of these nice beautiful details about our function and then attempt to actually sketch what the original function looked like based on this information that we've learned through derivatives. So part A in the text, says to find all the turning points and determine their nature. So is it a max or is it a min? So for part A, as I begin to approach this problem, remember that to find max mins, that requires uh, taking a first derivative, set it equal to zero, that's where I get horizontal slopes. So my first derivative of the function is going to look like 8x cubed minus 8x. And now I want to set this equal to zero and find where the derivative is positive, negative, all those things. So if I set this equal to zero, I'm going to go ahead and factor out an 8x here. I get x squared minus 1. And if I continue factoring, I get like an x plus 1 and x minus 1. That's just a difference of squares going on there. And so I can find that my critical points, remember these are values where the slope is horizontal, so critical points wind up being at 0, negative 1, and positive 1. All right, so now let's use that information to build our sign chart and determine where the functions increasing, decreasing, are these points maximums or minimums. So I'll put negative 1, 0, positive 1. Okay, so I'll be choosing values within each um, interval to determine if the slope is positive or negative. So from over here, I might determine f prime at negative 2 and see what I get. So I'm basically, I'm going to use the factored form. A lot of times your factored form can save you a lot of work when you're plugging in numbers because then you can see if the factors themselves are positive or negative. So if I plug in negative 2 to my derivative function, um, here I'm going to get 8 times negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And then take a look at how many negatives are getting multiplied here. I've got 1, 2, 3 negatives multiplied together, which means the answer is going to be negative overall. Okay, let's do the same for this interval. I'm going to use um, maybe negative 1 half. And then do that same kind of idea where I'm plugging it into the factors. So if I take negative 1 half here, then I get 8 times negative 1 half. Negative 1 half plus 1 is positive 1 half. Negative 1 minus 1 is just negative 3 halves. And if I take a look again at all the negatives getting multiplied here, a negative times a negative is just positive. There's only two. So that means that overall this is going to be positive. All right, let me create some space. Um, for this next interval, let's do f prime at positive 1 half. So I can start plugging it in for my x values. I get x to, or 8 times 1 half. Um, 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And now I've got negative times all these other positives. Overall, the result is negative. So again, notice how I'm not even like doing the arithmetic. I'm just checking to see if the sign is positive or negative. Last interval, let's say f prime at positive 2. So what happens over here? Well, if I plug in positive, that's going to be positive. 2 plus 1, yeah, that's positive. 2 minus 1, it's positive again. So all those numbers wind up being positive. This interval is positive. OK. So now I want to kind of make a mental note to myself that negative means negative slope, and then positive slope, negative slope, ultimately positive slope over here. So I can pretty clearly see which one of these are max and min values. So if I want to answer part A, here are the critical points and uh, or the turning points. And I can tell that, that negative 1 is a minimum. So x equals negative 1 is a minimum value. x equals 0 in the middle here is a maximum. 
this is a max. And when x is equal to 1, I get another minimum value. OK, so that's part A of the problem, is just find that first derivative, check for intervals, positive, negative, um, and then that gets you to your max and min ideas. OK, so part B says now actually report those intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. So we've actually done that work for ourselves using our sign chart to determine max and mins. So if I want to report intervals of decrease, I would look anywhere where the slope is negative. So I start here and it goes negative to about negative 1. So from negative infinity to negative 1, and then again from 0 to 1, so I'll use my union notation, so from 0 to 1, these intervals are where my function is decreasing. Again, don't include these critical points, don't include the turning points, because the slope there is 0, your function is not increasing or decreasing. So don't worry about those. They are not included. OK, so if I want to find where my function is increasing, that means positive slope. So I'm going to be looking here and here. It starts positive between negative 1 and 0. Union with the other set would be from 1 to infinity. OK, so that's part B that they're asking about, intervals of increase and decrease. Uh, for part C, find the intervals where the graph f is concave up or concave down. So concavity, remember, comes from my second derivative. Let's take a look. Change colors. So for part C, I'm looking at my second derivative. So that's a matter of taking my first derivative, and I'm going to use this version, not factored at all, because it's so much easier to take a derivative when you're not multiplying things together. So I'm going to use my unfactored version and just take a derivative of that. So f double prime is going to look something like um, 8 times 3 is 24 x squared minus 8. And now I'll factor this because I'm looking for points of inflection, which is where this is equal to 0. So start with that set equal to 0, factor this guy, and I'm getting, what, 8 times 3x squared minus 1. And if I want to solve this, right, I could divide both sides by 8. I know that if I divide by 8, I mean, this just remains 0. And then I've got 3x squared minus 1. How about we add the 1 and divide by 3? So I get x squared is equal to 1 third. Take a square root of both sides. I'm getting two inflection points, one at positive and negative, 1 over square root 3. So again, taking a square root of that, well, I can take a square root of 1 is just 1. Square root of 3 is root 3. So that's what I'm looking at here. Now let's go ahead and make a sign chart for double prime, for f double prime. One of these values is at negative 1 over root 3, and the other value is at positive 1 over root 3. And so you might be unsure of what that value is. I tend to be safe and just pick numbers I know are on other side or middle or um, farther over here. So for me, square root of 3 I know is between 1 and 2. So 1 divided by that. If I pick negative 2 over here, I'll be pretty safe. Also, please feel free to put that into your calculator to understand this number better, and then pick a number from over here. So if I want to do maybe like f double prime of negative 2, I can take that and plug that in up here. And here's kind of what I'm noticing. Negative 2 squared is positive 4. 24 times 4 minus 8. Geez, guys, it's just positive. So I'm not killing myself over the arithmetic. All right, how about 0? I know that 0 is between positives and negatives, so 0 has to be in here. And 24 times 0 is 0 minus 8. Yeah, this thing is negative. And then here, uh, let's say grab positive 2. If I plug that in, it's 24 times 4 again. Minus 8, it's definitely positive. Okay, 
So what I've basically gathered, the information I've gathered, is that it goes from concave up to down and then up again. So that's my concavity here. Now, if I were to report this using interval notation, then I'd probably say something like it's concave up whenever I'm looking from negative infinity to this value, to um, negative 1 over root 3. And then it's also concave up when we're looking at 1 over root 3 to infinity. It's concave down in between those values. So between negative 1 over root 3 and positive 1 over root 3. So those are my uh, concave down intervals and concave up intervals. All right. By the way, I do also want to point out that because the concavity changed from up to down and then down to up, these are true inflection points for my function. Notice that neither of these points is equal to these over here. So that means it's neither of those are horizontal inflection points. They aren't. Because if they were horizontal inflection points, then it would be equal to a horizontal slope as well. That's not happening, so that's not what my function looks like. Okay, so the last part of this is actually to sketch a graph of f of x. So I'm going to go ahead and erase the work that's up here, but keep my, um, my conclusions, you know, the increase, decrease, inflections, all that stuff down here, and we'll take a look at what f of x had to look like. Okay, so now that I've kind of set up a graph for myself, I'm going to sketch this. Now, sketching is a matter of just creating the shape of the graph, and I'm not super concerned about all the y values involved. If I wanted y values, I can take these x's, plug them in, get my y values, and then graph something really specific. But if I'm just, if I'm just like sketching it, I'm not super concerned about being really detailed and specific. Um, but I am going to use all this information to draw something quite close to what the graph should look like. All right, so first things first, let's put our max and min values on here. I have a minimum at negative 1 and at positive 1. So a minimum has kind of the shape of this, right? So I'm looking at horizontal slopes where I have a minimum, and I don't know, maybe a minimum here. Just want to encourage you not to think of minimums as always being down here in the negative way. All right, and then I have a maximum at 0. So maybe my maximum kind of looks like this at uh, zero. Okay, now it'll be super important to understand what your inflection point means. So our inflection point, I go from concave up, which heavens makes sense because I have a minimum going on here that there's a um, positive concavity. So it goes from concave up to being concave down somewhere in between zero and negative one. So somewhere in between here, specifically at this negative one over root three uh, value. So I think negative one over square root three, somewhere in there, and then positive one over square root three, somewhere in here. And so essentially I'm finding these inflection points um, somewhere along my graph this way. Okay, so now that we've placed our max min values, we've put our inflection points on there, I have to switch the concavity at those points. Let's see if we can graph something that might look pretty close to what this function should be. So I'm going to try and remain concave up from here down. So concave up, and then right at that pink inflection point is where I switch concavity. So it'll start looking down to be concave down, so all the way through there. And then it switches to being concave up again. So maybe something like that. And there's my fourth degree polynomial with max and mins placed at the correct x values and the inflection points at their correct x values. And I just want to really point out how I planned this out by placing those first and then placing my inflection points next build that concave up and then down and then up and really make sure that your concavity is switching at those inflection points because that's what you know it means to have correct inflection points. Okay, so this is a good workaround to get through those examples um, as you start sketching your own functions.